now we're here Looking back on where we come from Because of you and nothing we've done To deserve the love and mercy you show Your grace was strong enough to pick us up And you made a way When our backs were And it looked like Oh, but Lord, you made a way And now we're standing here Only because you made a way You made a way when our backs were, when our backs were against the wall And it looks as if it was over You made a way And now we're standing here Only because you made a way And you move mountains you call the world to fall with your power for a full miracles and there is nothing that's impossible now we're standing here only because you made a way you move mountains and you call the world to fall and with your power perform miracles and there is nothing that's impossible now we're standing here only because you made a way you move mountains you cause the world to fall and with your power perform miracles and there is nothing that's impossible now we're standing here only because you made a way and we're standing here only because you made a way and we're standing here only because you Don't know how, but you did it, made a way. Don't know how, but you did it. I don't know how, but you did it. I don't know how, but you did it. I don't know how, but you did it. And I don't know why, but I'm grateful. I don't know why, but I'm grateful. I don't know why, but I'm grateful. I don't know why. And we're standing here only because you made a way. For just $67, you can make as many videos as you want, and you never need to pick up a camera or... I thank Sister Rushin so much for that wonderful song. I feel like running and dancing and jumping because that song really resonated with me. And I hope that it resonated with you as well, that we serve a God who will move mountains and cause walls to fall, perform miracles, Oh, there is nothing that is impossible with our great God. 
And today I'm standing right here only because the great God of heaven went in the way. Oh, you made a way, God, when there was no way. And so I know that the best decision that I have ever made in my entire life, the best, the absolute best decision that I have ever made is making Jesus my Lord and Savior. I have never regretted it. He has done awesome and wonderful things. Thank you so much, Sister Rasheen, for that wonderful song. I also want to thank the praise theme for also setting the tone that we serve a God whose love is eternal. You know, we cannot exhaust it. We cannot go over it. We cannot go under it. You know, you know God's love is forever. And so we have come today to worship him. We have come to worship him in the beauty of holiness. I just want to say happy Sabbath and good morning to all of us worshiping God today. I want to um, personally acknowledge our friends and our members and our visitors and the children and all those who are listening to me from the various platforms, whether you are listening on Zoom, <coughs> Facebook, or you are listening on your calling line, or you're seated today in the congregation. Indeed, God is a good God, and we have come today to do nothing else but to worship him, to lift him up, and to give him all the praises. I also would like to acknowledge our, our church pastor, Pastor Hanson Drisdale, and, and just want to, to say, Pastor, that I really recognize your leadership, your stewardship, and your guardianship of the church and the people of God. Oh, I continue to pray for you, Pastor, as you do ministry, that God will bless your ministry, and that God will bless you, and that as you minister and as you lead out, that the people of God will see Jesus in you and will want to follow him. Today, the sermonic portion comes to us from the book of St. Luke, and it's St. Luke chapter 15, a very well-known story, and it was ably read by Sister Sheila Holman. But I just want to reread for emphasis verses... 22 through to 24. And we're going to, to see what God has to say to us today from this passage. So it's Luke chapter 15. And we are again um, just, you know, um, looking at verses 22 through to 24. It, it will be the climax of the message today. And so I am reading from the King James Version, and I will read in your airing. And the scripture reads thus. It says, but the father said to his servant, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and, and let us eat and be merry. Oh, for this my son was dead but is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make merry. Uh, the, the, the topic for the sermon today is entitled Love, Forgiveness, and Sacrifice. Love, Forgiveness, and Sacrifice. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Break me, melt me, and mold me into what you want me to be today. Lord, I want you to speak to me. So I am listening. I pray in a very special way that you will pass by through the medium of your Holy Spirit. And that you, your presence will just over us. That you will give us a blessing today. Give us a message of hope and encouragement. And at the end of 
today's sitting, at the end of our worship experience today, and may, Lord, we be always careful to give you and you alone the glory, the praise, the honor, and the admiration, or oh, because we ask it all in Jesus' name, let the church say amen. Love, forgiveness, and sacrifice. Love, forgiveness, and sacrifice. And so here in, in, in St. Luke chapter 15, we find Jesus. And Jesus was here. He was, he, was, he was sitting with publicans and sinners. Not only was Jesus sitting with them, the scripture tells us that Jesus, he was also talking with them. He was also having discussions with them. And he was even eating with them. Now, this became a problem for the scribes and Pharisees. You know, it was very unsettling to them that here was a Jewish Jesus, you know, associating with publicans and sinners. These scribes and Pharisees, the scripture allows us to understand, were very critical of Jesus' interactions with these publicans and sinners. And so they began, began to have discussions among themselves and, you know, began to, you know, wonder what kind of Jesus was this. You see, church, you see, people of God, that the, these religious leaders did not believe that they had a responsibility to tell the common people about the love of God. Oh, and not only that, they did not understand the, that the God of heaven did not have favorites. They were the true, they were the chosen people, but they were not God's favorites because God has no favorites. But these scribes and Pharisees also did not really understood what the love of God meant. And so Jesus began to enlighten their darkness. You know, Jesus, you know, thought about schooling them in the school of Jesus Christ. And so the scripture tells us that, that he began to tell them this path. And as we all know, that, that a parable is, a, is an earthly story with, with, with a heavenly message. It, so, so Jesus, you know, wanted to capture for them who he was, why he was here, what he was about, and what really was this plan of salvation. And we will all see it unfold in the text. You know, as, as children, we would sing the song, everybody ought to know, some people don't know who Jesus is. And so this was a moment, and this was an opportunity that Jesus was going to use to let the scribes and the Pharisees know why he was here. And so Jesus began to tell the story. And so verse 11 of Luke chapter 15 tells the story that here was a father who had two sons. And so the younger son was very sick of him. He was weary of his father's curfews, sick and tired of his father's rules, tired of his father's constant presence. Mad because he was not getting a chance to make his own decisions. This younger son was so dissatisfied at home, the scripture allows us to understand, to the point where he thought that his father was holding him back. He felt that he was just moving in it father's shadows, and he wanted out. And so the scripture tells us that this young man, that he, he devised the plan, and he, and he thought to himself that 
his father, you know, when his father is dead, he's entitled to him. And so he, he talked about it and he thought about it and, and he went to his father and he said to his father, give me the portion of inheritance that falleth to me. Now from Jewish history, we, we, we know that the younger son would get one third of the father's inheritance and the older son would get two thirds of the father's inheritance. Now the, the scripture tells us that this father divided the inheritance and gave to both of them. The eldest got his two thirds and the younger who was clamoring for his God is one thing. I want us still to just chronicle down that the father was not there. And that is significant. The father was not there. However, without hesitation, here was this father conceded to his son's request and gave him his portion of the inheritance. Oh, church, today, I am so glad that God does not force us to love him. God does not force us to serve him. God does not force us to pray to him. And he does not force us not even to worship him. Whatever we do for the Father, it must come naturally. It must not be coerced or forced. The father understood something as he gave this boy his inheritance that some things are best learned outside the home. And he, want, and, 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 and he wanted this son to understand that experience is a great teacher, but experience is also a hard teacher. But when it teaches you, you cannot take it back. When experience teaches you, you cannot undo it. So here was this father. And, and as, we, as I tried to grapple with, you know, the father, you know, without hesitancy and without reluctancy, giving this boy, the younger son, his inheritance. I recognize that the, the father understood that there were some lessons, hard lessons that he was going to learn. But not only that, but that if he was going to truly love the Father, it must be by choice. And so um, the Father, the scripture tells us, gave him his inheritance. And so as the Father gave him his inheritance, the Bible tells us, that he, he began to, to, to pack up his things. He, beca he began to pack up all the things that he had to leave the Father's house and the Father's presence. You see, sometimes, church, we, we, we might point our finger at this younger son and, and, and fail to recognize that in all of us, we have some of this younger son syndrome. Oh, we are in the Father's house church, and, and yet we feel like we can make it on our own. That's the younger son syndrome. We also sometimes feel we can do, do better than the Father's help. And so he got his inheritance, and not many days, he, he packed up everything he had. Watch this. He left the Father's house. But not only did he leave the father's house, he left the father's presence. And so the Bible tells us that this young man went to a far country. Oh, in a far country, there is no accountability. No one has to tell him how to spend his resources. Oh, in a far country, there was no stewardship. Nobody had to tell him what to do. Oh, in a far country, there were no rules. There were no principles that he should follow. And so he went, the scripture tells us, to a far country. 
I want also us to write this down. A far country also represents a lost condition. He was far away from home. And as I thought about it, I wondered to myself that he never went to another, another state, you know, or he never went to down south or east. He, he left his country entirely. And we're going to see later on how this impacted this boy. So he was in a new country and he was everybody's socialite. He was living it up and he was lavish and reckless. He, he was wasting his inheritance. He, he, he had friendships, you know, with, with, he had friends and friends and, and more friends. And so we are told that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And I want to put a plug in here for our parents. Sometimes a child's decision is not a reflection of a parent, of a good parent. So sometimes a child's decision is not a reflection of how we parent him. Because here was this young man. He had a, a good father who grew him right in the way of the Lord. However, sin will take you farther than you want to go and cost you more than you want to pay. Or the, the, the things of this world will fill you, but the things of this world cannot fulfill you. And so there came a time, and so he lived large. He had, you know, Benz and Bimas and flashy cars and just everything and living it up large. And so the Bible tells us in verse 14 that there came a point when all the resources dried up. He had spent everything. And as I thought about it, I thought about how unwise this young boy was. He spent everything. He never, he never left any bus fare, taxi fare, or air fare. He spent everything. And he was far from home. And so, uh, you know, you know, you know, God would so have it that he spent everything and now a famine was in the land. So a famine was in the land and, and he now had to find work. Now, remember I said that he was, he was not in another state. He was very far from home. So it was going to take some amount of doing to get him home. And so um, the Bible tells us that he, he was looking for work. And because he was not at home and he wasn't a citizen, he had to align himself with a citizen of that country to get some work. And I don't know if some people understands what that means. And so the worst job in town he got, a job to take care of pigs. Now here was a Jewish boy working in a pig pen. It was the lowest of low points. That was something that, was, that a Jewish boy was not supposed to do. But here he was in a pig pen um, feeding swines. And so um, what this boy fails to recognize was that the distance from the father's house brings disconnection in your life. When you are disconnected from God, you are disconnected in your life. Things just are all out of place and all over. He couldn't, he would come to understand that as much as he wanted only the money and possession of the father, he was better off with the presence of the father. Oh, church, today I want us to recognize that money can buy Money can't buy everything, 
Cars will depreciate. Houses will go into foreclosure. Money can purchase a bed, but it cannot give you rest. Or money can buy a house, but it is not a home. Money can buy friends, but it is not. It does not bring you friendship. And so while they're in the pig pen, at the lowest point of his experience, you know, we recognizing that he was born to be a prince and a son of honor and not Now he was living in absolute shame. Sometimes it is in our affliction that we come to our senses. Or it was in Babylonian's affliction that King Manasseh came to his senses and recognized the God of heaven. He was a wicked king. Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar would come to his senses after God sent him into the wilderness for seven years to eat grass like an animal. And so here we have this prodigal boy would come to his senses after his pig pen experience. And so he came to himself, the, the Bible tells us, and he had this moment where he sensed the the sovereignty of God and the majesty of God and and he recognized who created him and and what he was created to be and and this boy wondered why he was settling for less than he was created to be so sometimes It takes a pig pen experience for us to know our value. And so he came to himself, thank God. And he he said that, can you imagine my father? How many hired servants have my father? And I am here working in a pig pen, dying for hunger, eating pig food. How many hired servants of my father? And my father treats the servants so well that they don't want to leave. (laughs) And so he said, I will arise and I will go to my father. And I will confess, Father, that I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against thee. Oh, make me as one of thy hired servants. Oh, the Bible tells us, church, that as he began to make the journey home, you know, when he was a great way off, the Father recognized his form. Oh, you see, church, every day since the boy left, his father was praying and waiting in anticipation for the boy to return home. And so when the father saw him in the distance, the, 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 the Bible says the father ran to him and I hugged him and kissed him and the father was so happy to see this boy his son oh, oh, oh I, I know that you know remember this boy was working in a pig pen and the scripture says that nobody gave him anything so I can imagine that he, he looked aesthetically repulsive not only did he look bad he smelled bad but here was a, was a father's love embrace his son in his mess there was another reason why the father embraced the boy. Oh, we are allowed to understand from Jewish history that because of what the disrespect that this boy had shown to the father, if he ever returned, he was supposed to be stoned to death. And so the father waiting for him, waiting for him, here's waiting for him. And when he recognizes frame, 
the father ran and hugged him, the Bible tells us. that. And in hugging the boy, the father was saying to all around, to get to this boy, you have to come through me first. What a father. And so he, he hugged the boy. And he walked with the boy home, I assume. And, and the, son, the son confessed to the father. He said, Father, I have sinned. And, and immediately, the son said, immediately, the father did not even wait until he was finished acknowledging that he had sinned and he, he wanted to be a sermon. Immediately, the scripture tells us that the father restored him. Oh, I thank God for Jesus. I thank God that he alone is God and that he loves us unconditionally because if I mess up and make a mistake and I am in a 21st century postmodern church, they're going to put me at the back and say that I am not allowed to do anything for so many and so many and so many years and months. But here was a father. And here was Jesus saying to the scribes and Pharisees and saying to all of us the kind of character he has and the kind of character that he wants us to have. He restored the boy. Immediately he was restored. And this is my favorite part. And in restoring the boy, the father placed a robe on him. Oh, church of the living God. Oh, the, the robe represents the righteousness of Christ. Because when we come back to God, God forgives us and he gives us his robe of righteousness. Righteousness. The songwriter said, covered with his life, whiter than snow. Yes, by his life, then shall I know. Oh, we are covered by the life of Jesus. So Jesus, the father, covered the boy, restored the boy, forgave the boy. After he confessed and acknowledged his sins. Oh, not only was he restored and not only was his, 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 his covering God placed this robe of righteousness on him, representing the righteousness of Christ. But God also placed a ring on his finger. Oh, church, when I, when I read the, 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 the passage of scripture, oh, I got so excited because the ring represents the father's authority, the name of the father, the province of the father, the father's authority. And so when God restores us, we are restored fully. So he got a robe representing the father's righteousness. He got a ring representing the father's name and the father's seal and the father's authority. And I say, praise the Lord. So not only did he get a robe and a ring, which is the seal of the father's authority. Oh, for us Bible students, we know that Revelation chapter 7 says that those who are found written in the Lamb's book of life, God will mark us with the seal of God, representing his province, his name, his power, and his authority. Oh, I want you to get it, church. This text is so powerful. Jesus was unveiling to the scribes and the Pharisees and the people around him the plan of salvation and the plan of redemption in this one text. It was a parable. Ooh, what a God. And I never saw it like that before until I was preparing it and so not only did 
he get a robe and a ring. But the father put shoes on his feet. So, 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 Sister Dristel, what does shoes represent? If, if, if I was reading my history books correctly, I, I know that the, the slaves used to sing the song, Oh, I've got shoes, you have got shoes, all of God's children got shoes, because when we get to heaven, we are gonna have shoes. Shoes means that we are not slaves, shoes means we are are not servants. Shoes means we are sons and daughters of the most high God. And so the shoes that the father placed on him represented sonship. And I say amen. Oh, I'm coming down. I'm not going to keep you long today. The message is getting sweeter and sweeter. And so here he was, covered in the righteousness of the father. He had the, 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 the father's authority as sealed by this ring. Because everywhere he went with this ring. And once he placed the ring there and engraved it, it was covered because it represented his father's authority. It also means that when we are sons and daughters of the most high God and when we walk in the way of the Lord in the light of his word even demons will flee because we move with the father's authority so he had a robe he had a ring and he had shoes oh thank you Jesus and so, you know, robe, a ring, and shoes. Was he fully restored? Was he fully restored? Oh, but the father, the father knew. You see, if we, I want us when we go home to just read the text carefully. The father knew that sin demanded a sacrifice for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life because without the shedding of blood there was no remission of sin so watch the father the father had this fatted calf that he was it was without blemish that he was feeding it and taking care of it I, I, I don't believe the father knew what the occasion would be that he would use it but he knew it was for a sacrifice and in order for the complete restoration of this boy to take place sin demands a sacrifice And so the father said, bring me that fatted calf. Let us kill the calf. And the calf represented the sacrifice. Oh, church of the living God, for three and a half years, Jesus, who was telling this parable, was walking among men, teaching them, healing the sick, raising the dead. And when the fullness of time came, Jesus walked to go God hill and died in our stead and that's the true sacrifice so bound up in the story of the lost boy really where Jesus was heading was the fact that he was indeed the sacrifice that he loves us with an everlasting love and that there is nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing that we can do that he will not forgive us and cover us with his robe of righteousness. But not only that, he loves us so much that he will never let the enemy snatch us out of his hand. And so he was willing to become 
the sacrifice. And so I go back to the story. So watch this now. I want you to watch it. The celebration could not start until the sacrifice was made. And after the sacrifice, the boy was fully restored. And I say, amen. Oh, what a God we serve. And so this was what Jesus was trying to say to the scribes and the Pharisees. That I've come to heal the brokenhearted. To give sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. Because guess what? You know, sometimes even the church, we don't recognize it. A son is always a son. A son is always a son. It doesn't matter where the son has been, where he has gone in the sight of God. It doesn't matter if we are on the corner. We are drugged up. We are prost. It doesn't matter who, who we are in God's sight. A son is always a son. And so God wants us to have that perspective for the lost and for each other because we will err and make mistakes. Oh, I am closing church in the sacrifice of Jesus. So I hope you get it. So here Jesus told this parable for the essence of it, the plan of salvation the plan of redemption to buy man back. In the sacrifice of Jesus, light met darkness. Love conquered hatred. Death gives way to life. And the plan of salvation was made available. Oh yes, church of the living God. Oh yes, Everyone within the hearing of my voice on the various platforms. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you have been. It doesn't matter how messy your situation is. You can find your way home. Well, my final point is that the father, you notice the father never went after the boy. But the father, when he was ready to come, when he came to himself, the father was ready to meet him by the way. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God I have. He's willing and ready He's going to give us so much. He gives us so much so that we can make an intelligent decision. He gives us enough to make an intelligent decision to choose him. And when we, we set on the road home, he's going to meet us by the way. And so I want the song now. I don't know if Sister Hill is listening to me. I, I want the song now for us to close. You know, I love this little song. It says that many times in my childhood, as I traveled so far, Sister Hill, can I get the song? By nightfall, a weary I grew.
message today is for somebody. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, you know, the Lord placed this message on my heart. But so, somebody might be listening to me and recognize that it's time to come home. You know, it is so interesting that God allows us to be in a pandemic. So if you're afraid to walk down the aisle, you don't have to walk down the aisle. You can make that decision in your own personal space. So this afternoon, if you have been touched by the message and you recognize that you went to a far country and it's, and it's time to come home to the Father's house, I want you to um, just, 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 place, just, 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 just place it in the chat. You know, we have prayer warriors to pray with you. We have an interest coordinator who will take your information. You know, sometimes God places us in a situation for us to make a decision for him. It is my prayer today that as you see God's love, as you see God's forgiveness, as you recognize the sacrifice that he has made for our salvation, oh, your answer will be yes, Lord, yes. And so that's for the persons that are, are listening via different platforms. Just place the text in the chat. Place your information that you want prayer or you want Bible study. Oh, this really is not our home because one day we are really going home. For those in the congregation, if you believe that it is time for you to come home, that the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart, would you just raise your hand? Say, it's time to come home. Is there such a person here today that God sent this message specifically for you and he has given you all this time? to make this decision. Would you raise your hand? Let us pray. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you for the kind of God that you are. Loving and forgiving. You were willing to garb your divinity and humanity and walk the terrible road to Calvary to save us from sin. Oh Lord, I know that one day you're coming back because this is not our home. But Lord, while you tarry, I pray that somebody, Lord, somebody who listened to this message today, they will find their way home they will take start the journey so that you can meet them on the way i thank you god for loving us thank you for forgiving us thank you for saving us i ask lord that you will help us to extend that love and that forgiveness to each other Help us, Lord, to extend that kind of love and forgiveness so that we can meet you when you come. In Jesus' name I pray. Let the church say amen.
Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in the song with sweet accord. Join in the song with sweet accord and the surround the throne and the surround the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those read never knew our love, but children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King, may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching up to Zion, the beautiful city of God. The hills of Zion give a thousand secrets sweet before we reach the heavenly field. Before we reach the heavenly fields, the walk, the golden stream, the walk, the golden stream. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching up to Zion. The beautiful city of God. Then let our songs upon and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fair world. Do it, dear Father. You have given a word, your servant, for us at this time. You could feel your holy presence among us as your daughter spoke. Many of us, dear Father, are still a long ways from home. So we ask, dear God, that you would wait for us. And we know you will wait for us. We thank you for your message today. We thank you for the messenger. I pray, dear God, that we never forget this message. We always remember the prodigal. Lord, help us to recognize that you are in the pits among the hogs. We need to rise up and come home to our Father. Let us take this message out to the world and tell them that there's a better place than the pig pen. Again, we thank you for your servant. We thank you for the message. As we separate one from another. Please go with us. Bless our various homes. May your Holy Spirit continue to abide with us. Again, dear Father, grant us your peace. And when time shall be no more, help us, dear Father, to walk through the pearly gates. It is our prayer for Christ's sake. Amen and amen.
before our praise team closes us out, um, we can still have the music play. I just want to remind you of the following messages. That way we can um, just continue to have our closing music. echo Elder Nicholson's comments. We want to thank Sister Drisdell for a powerful and timely message. What better gift do we have than to be covered in the righteousness of God's robe and, and that he are, we are precious in his sight. And let us not make this place our home, but strive to make heaven our home. I want to remind you of the following announcements. At 4 p.m., we will have our